Hello everybody, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. I uh, hope everyone's doing well out there. Today we're going to talk about audio compression. And always when I say that, I have to make clear, I don't mean compression and amplitude, that's for later. What I mean is shrinking the size of an audio stream of a PCM representation of audio so that it can be stored and transmitted more efficiently. And it's a big topic, so I've broken it into two pieces. We're gonna first talk in this lecture about some of the ideas and theory behind audio compression. And then in the next talk, we'll talk about how you actual, how actual compression schemes tend to play out. So I hope this will be fun. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So let's start by sort of considering these 16-bit audio samples we've been throwing around for a while, um, the principles are the same, sort of regardless of the size of the sample or how it's represented, but giving something concrete to work on is kind of fun. Um, so if we have a 16-bit audio sample, we can sort of conceptually break it into three pieces. Uh, you know, this is not a hard and fast distinction, but it's gives it's how I think about audio when I think about these samples. First, up at the top, there's some headroom. That is, typically when we ship these samples around, and especially when we're working on and processing these samples, we don't want to record them at absolute maximum am amplitude. Now, obviously, that would be the best from the point of view of containing the most information per sample. But the problem is now, anytime you try to manipulate the sample in any way, you tend to run off the end of your 16 bits which for a lot of hardware and for a lot of software can be a real problem because it actually works with the 16-bit samples directly instead of going to some floating point representation coming back later. And so, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon at all to deliberately leave a couple of bits headroom up at the top so that when you add two signals together, for example, it won't overflow and then you divide by two to get it back into the room. Um, if obviously if you have insufficient headroom, the problem you run into is one we've talked about extensively already, which is clipping. The samples will get limited at the top and bottom of the 16-bit range, and that's a bad thing in general. And then there's some bits that sort of are notionally good, accurate audio bits. You need those, you want to preserve them. Uh, the higher ones obviously matter more than the lower ones. I really want to get those first uh eight bits or 10 bits right uh, there in that. So, you know, if we sort of figure we're going 10 bits in here, um, you know, plus a couple bits up at the top. So these last few bits uh, down here are going to be sort of start to blend into noise. Uh, typically your microphone isn't that good. Your ADC isn't that good. Every time you process the signal, then you're gonna get some sort of garbage from the arithmetic computations being inexact down here. What tends to pile up in a 16-bit sample is that the bottom three, four bits at least are not that useful. They mostly don't contain information that you care about from an audio point of view. They're also really hard to hear. Our ear just doesn't have so much dynamic range that it's going to make a big difference if those bits are noise. Um, so I sort of think of that lower, those lower bits as sort of the noise bits. But like I say, that's not a hard and fast rule. It depends on how your audio was produced, what you know you're doing with it. If uh, if you had a very noisy environment when you recorded, or if you have a very noisy system that you're processing with, or you've done a crazy amount of processing on the signal, you know it might be that you only have ten good bits. Um, but including headroom, so eight good bits of audio, but no, more normally you'd have to 12. Uh, and so, you know, that's sort of a way to think of it. And, you know, we do have to worry about clipping. It's a big deal. We've talked about it a bunch more, um, you know, sort of like you did in the first homework assignment for people taking my course, you know, you, you clip the sample, and uh, you're gonna get the tops clipped off waves, distortion's gonna be a bad thing. And you know, this clipping, the reason we do it on purpose, like you learned earlier, is that 
you know, we've heard it so much that it starts to sound good, but really it's never a great kind of, of distortion. And uh, so we really want to leave headroom. When I talk about noise, there's a lot of different kinds of noise. The sort of noises found in nature break into sort of several different categories. And at some point I should probably play examples of those for you. But the, the white noise is sort of imagine that I take a f sequence of random four bit numbers and add them onto my audio signal. Right? So, uh, you know, I literally use a random number generator that goes in the range of zero to 15 and, you know, or from minus set eight to seven more likely. And I say, well, yeah, I'm just going to throw that on there. Now I got four bits of noise that is white noise. It sounds very, very, um, very noisy. There's also other kinds of noise that come up a lot. There's pink noise, one over F noise, which is sort of a product of some kinds of natural process. It sounds a little different. There's the noise you get from sort of a random walk in a time domain, which is called Brownian or one, or one over F squared noise. There's a nice Wikipedia article talking about just noise colors. But at the end of the day, you know, Noise may be a thing. A snare, for example, in a snare drum is an important noise, and you wouldn't want to lose it altogether, but you don't necessarily care so much about the exact samples of that noise. You just want it to have the right color and shape. And that's actually an interesting active area of audio compression research is how can you identify that noise and maybe lossy, re you know, regain it without having to replicate it, for example example. Um, so when we talk about compressing audio, when we talk about shrinking the size of our bit stream, we're going to take advantage of the structure of the audio that I'm talking about to sort of try to figure out what's going on. And you know that everything I've set up to now is sort of a time domain view. There's also this notion that audio is comprised of frequencies. What we're looking for, I guess is my point, is sort of a sparse representation of the signal, a, a representation where I can mostly reconstruct uh, the signal from very little information. So for a sinusoid, for example, if that's all my audio sample is, is a sine wave at some frequency, then I can really reconstruct it, you know, and at fixed amplitude, I can really reconstruct a 10 minute signal by just saying, well, it's a sine wave, wave at this amplitude with this frequency and phase. And you now know literally everything you need to know about what the signal is. But of course, in real audio, you don't get perfect sine waves. It's, you know, there's some art, you could have some argument about what even a perfect 16 bit sine wave is, because am I rounding down? Am I rounding up? Am I rounding? you know, to nearest. So, you know, that's an argument already. The point is, no matter what your sparse model is, so we call this thing a predictive model of the signal. And by the way, a lot of this, even though I'm talking about it in the context of audio compression, is not just an audio compression thing. It's a general theory of compression thing, gzip or whatever you're using, zip, whatever you're using to compress your files, does the same thing. They say, well, let's try to build a model that predicts what the sample is going to look like from a sparse representation, what the data is going to look like from a sparse representation, and we'll send that sparse representation over the wire. And that's great because sparse representations are sparse. I mean, it would be great to be able to send a few dozen bytes instead of a long file of sine wave samples. But like I say, you're going to make some mistakes. And maybe if I really am just transmitting a sine wave like that, I don't care very much whether that lowest order bit of the 16 bits is exactly perfect. And maybe my sine wave generator is really a perfect sine of X generator. By the way, real signal generators tend to have distortion even when they're trying to produce perfect sine waves. But maybe ours is, you know, digital and it's the samples are perfect. Even then, I mean, it might have some low order bit stuff. Maybe you don't care, right? Maybe for my purposes, I don't actually have to reproduce the signal perfectly at the other end, you know, sample for sample. I just have to get close. In that situation, we can use what's called lossy compression. Compute our sparse model. We send the model over the wire or store the model in a file. And later we reconstruct something that's close 
Okay, maybe that's good enough. And that's the lossy compression plane. Well, sometimes you really don't want to lose a bit ever. So for example, if you're gonna archive music, store it on a, you know, from a CD or something like that, there's really, both practically and theoretically, you'd really like later when you unarchived your music to have it come back the exact same sample for sample thing that you got off the CD. There's really no need to lose music if you're willing to pay. And the payment here comes along with the typical thing you do is what's called residue encoding. So I take my model and I, you know, I build my model, my predictive model of what the signal is going to look like. I subtract that from the original signal. What I'm going to have left over is what's called a residue, the places where my model didn't predict perfectly, right? And if everything is ideal, then that residue is a low amplitude thing. I, I sort of, um, I, I don't have that much difference between the model's predictions and the other. And so, Maybe that's a, a less information signal, and I can compress that as well using some scheme designed for compressing, you know, small values. And I can represent that residue signal just, and I can send or store both the model, both the sparse model and the residue. And now I can perfectly reconstruct the file later. And of course, the price for that is that. The residue tends to be, if your model's really good, still the residue tends to be substantial, and so you're really not going to get as good a compression go for lossless compression. And the rest, residue might be compressible too. There's, you know, all kinds of multi-stage schemes. I imagine at this point you're having a whole bunch of ideas about well, why don't you know maybe we should try blah or why don't we just do blah? Absolutely. Um, this field is very active. There's a million ideas. It's one of those things where everything kind of works, nothing works perfect, and so there's been a lot of exploration over a really long time, especially for audio, of what good lossy and loss lossless compression formats look like, and we'll talk about some of the current lossy and lossless compression formats next time. So, the first problem is building a predictive model, a model that, you know, given the history of your signal, tells you what it looks like in the future, or given the overall signal, tells you what it looks like. Um, these kinds of models, sparse models, are, you know, sort of you have two choices, right? You could build a time domain model, I mean, two obvious choices, you have a million choices. You could build a time domain model where you try to predict, you know, what the signal looks like from samples nearby um you know so, and or you could have a frequency domain model so you know the the time domain model audio signals tend to be smooth they don't tend to just jump around randomly from sample to sample so the 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 sam samples nearby a given sample tend to be related to it uh if you draw curves you know they tend to be continuous so there are big differences further they tend to have continuous derivatives so they don't jump up or down suddenly and so you know if you wanted to model the signal as locally over a small region as sort of a line or a polynomial or a spline some kind of shape then you could save just the parameters you know the slope and offset of that line the coefficients of the polynomials the you know control control points for the spline and that would give you a model that locally was pretty close to your original signal, but contained less information, contained less bits than, uh, you know, sort of a bunch of 16-bit samples. And so that would be a plan, and that's a very common thing to do. The other common thing to do is to take advantage of the fact that, you know, the spectrum of a signal tends to be sparse and of an audio signal tends to be sparse and the changes in frequency tend to not happen sharply all that often either uh, you know if you listen to a piece of music it may be that at the attack of a note or at the end near the end of a note the signals are changing some but an awful lot of you know a hundred millisecond block of samples the in the frequency domain it all looks pretty similar and you 
So you might want to take some quantized model of the spectrum over time, right? Uh, what are the frequencies right now? What are the amplitudes of those frequencies? You might quantize those to get less bits in your representation. And that gives you a model of your signal. Now, if you're going to do your residue coding in the time domain, which you kind of have to, you got to be a little careful about phase. It's a little confusing because you know, the phase isn't very audible. We've talked about that before, but it is visible. It is going to change the shape of the samples. And so if you're trying to do lossless compression, you have to be careful. So, you know, the idea here, like I said a bit ago, is that the, the amplitude of the residue that you get after you subtract your model from the signal, it should be pretty small relative to the signal amp amplitude. That's sort of the definition of what a good fit is. And so, you know, already maybe you can just use fewer bits to encode the residue than you, you know, 16, hopefully a lot fewer, and give you a bunch of compression. But you might also take advantage of the fact that the residue itself might be compressible and that there are more efficient coding schemes, you know, for this kind of difference than just representing it as directly. Um, and so it's really common to use things like Huffman coding, Gollum Rice coding, arithmetic coding to uh, sort of take the residue and compress it in turn. Because again, if you're doing lossless compression, it's going to be a big substantial piece of the story. And so you'd like to squeeze it as hard as you can. Um, and that takes advantage sort of of the, typically of the fr frequency distribution of residue, which again, one of the problems with audio is every use, word is used 50 different ways. What I mean by that here is the probability that you'll get a given difference, you know, is going to be high for small differences, lower for large differences. And these coding schemes tend to take those probability distributions um, and use them to their advantage in producing shorter code. I mean, in the music business and the sound business, there's a lot of sort of which do you want to do? Do you care about lossless? Are you willing to settle for lossy? Um, lossless compression, you're not going to necessarily get that much compression. FLAC file sizes on sort of real world audio files, FLAC being a lossless compression method, are really typically half the size. That sounds terrible, but it's kind of impressive in some ways, and it's hard to do dramatically, dramatically better uh, with a lossless compression. You just have to be coded. There's a lot of information signal in the Shannon sense, even if there isn't so much sound signal down at those. Um, and of course, there's some trade-off between how fancy your model is, which means how long is it going to take to compute, how much of the signal do you compute it, things like that. When you make it fancier like that, you get better compression. So there are always these trade-offs. Um, the problem with doing lossy compression the naive way I have described so far is that if that residue contains important stuff and you drop important stuff on the ground, um, you're going to have a problem with uh, that as well. And so the uh, thing that you're going to want to do is to try to build a, not just any model, but a model that the stuff it leaves behind as a residue is stuff the human ear isn't very good at hearing. And so we tend to use that psychoacoustics stuff that we talked about last really hard in lossy compression to think about what kind of residue, how can we build a model that, while it maybe isn't the most precise model in replicating the original samples, is the most precise model in terms of modeling what you need to have to uh, reconstruct the sound in a way that it sounds the same to the human ear. And uh, 
you know, that tends to be because the human ear is mostly a frequency measurement device. Uh, a lot of stuff done in the frequency domain, whereas lossless tends to be done more in the time domain. And the models tend to be sort of very generalized with a lot of free parameters so that you can adjust to different kinds of sounds and do the right thing. So that's sort of some of the principles of audio compression. We, we spend a lot of thought and effort on that, trying to get it right. And uh, like I say, in our next talk, we'll talk a little bit about some specific schemes and a few of the details about how they operate, sort of try to get our heads around how this audio compression thing plays out in practice. Uh, so that's what I've got for you. I hope it was useful. Thanks so much for listening, and I will talk to you again soon.